Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this event. Uh, my name is Charlotte Gehring. I'm the moderator within my own company, Charlie Speaks, and it is a great pleasure to be moderating this session on transitioning to an open science academic system, uh, discussing promotion, rewards, incentives, and so on. Um, so why do we organize this session? Well, it basically has to do with the fact that the EU Ministers for Research already in 2016 came together and committed to a full open science system in 2030. But, of course, there are many barriers still that need to be taken away. Uh, barriers with regard to the reward system for academics, but also, as Mr. Hengart actually pointed out, the reform of researcher evaluation processes. We need to focus on quality and on content. And finally, also, we need to focus on the development <laughs> of new research indicators and metrics. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have brought together four excellent speakers that will share with you their stories. And it's my great pleasure to first introduce to you of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Bogeman, who is the head of unit of Open Science within DG Research and Innovation. The floor is yours, and again, six minutes, and I'm going to be a little bit stricter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you can find the PowerPoint. This doesn't count in the six minutes, uh, Charlotte. No, it doesn't. Do you have the pointer already? Okay. But this is you, huh? This should work. Oh, that is me. Yeah. That's you. That's you. Okay, thank you. That's you as well. <laughs> so, uh, thank, thanks for um, giving me the floor. Thanks for the welcome. And uh, not the welcome trust, but the welcome words. <laughs> and uh, indeed, uh, so we have been very busy at the European Commission with uh, European science policy for the last three years. And I've mainly been busy the last couple of uh, months with... with uh, with a part of, of the open science which is a little bit under the radar of the discussion to, uh, today, but which I think on the, in the mid to long term will be much more important, which is uh, open data. So we have launched last week the uh, European Open Science Cloud, which is actually a way to try to avoid what our economists, our chief economists of the national competition policy uh, was warning for, namely the bundling of services, but then in this time, and, and you also, Michael, uh, in, in, in this case with, with data. So we want to create an open system whereby um, at the best possible conditions and at least at the best equitable possible of conditions, uh, researchers in Europe and later on uh, to be expanded uh, can take part in, in, in science. Because indeed, uh, the problems we face today we, in, in publishing, some of the problems we face today in publishing and for which we have Plan S, will be peanuts compared to if we would repeat the situation uh, at the level of data. This being said, what we also learned there is that uh, uh, in order to change the mentality, be because we have, we have forward a lot of, of principles like uh, your data should be mandatory, DMPs, uh, there should be mandatory fair formats in, in, man in certified repositories of the science cloud and so forth. The, the, the bottleneck there is that always comes back is, yeah, okay, but what will the researcher do? How can we incentivize the researcher? How can we bring him on board? And that's why I think this session is, is really very important. My personal view is that the most crucial element of the whole debate is what we are discussing now. And it is not a coincidence, so the culture, if you want, the research culture, eh? and the incentives and the rewards for it, because all the rest you can fix the <laughs> more or less. But this is really something that has to do with the day-to-day -day life and the motivation. And what we have been, and, and I must also say that, that from the Commission point of view, this is also the area where we did the least of the policy. Why? Because it's, it's largely subsidiary. Uh, talking about incentives is something that universities do and that, you do, that, that funders do at the national base, and for which the Commission has no uh, role, uh, no formal role to be taken, uh, and that should be the case. It is. It, it really belongs to what uh, the, the the organizing um, instances should do. So, uh, ju just to be uh, very short, so what what we are be, what we have been doing late, what what our focus is now, I would say, is, is to continue pushing for open access. I can come back that uh, later on. Launched the European Science Cloud was last week, and now trying to. Uh, to push, not trying to push, but pushing for uh, open data, uh, mandatory data management plans, which means also a change of culture. In the next framework program, every project will have to uh, foresee a mandatory DMP, data management plan, but you can opt out. 
Uh, you can opt out with the results, but you cannot op opt out with the obligation to provide the DMP. We want to go to a, a pan-European uptake of, of citizen science, and we are working for next year to have an agreement on what kind of protocols, templates, formats should be uh, uh, acceptable there so that funders and, and universities can, can uh, reward them. And then we are trying to, uh, to work, and I will come back to that in a second, on the whole problem, which I think is the Achilles heel of open science, in terms of the speed of uptake, because the world will become open science, that is for sure. Why? It is because it is better science, it is, it is, it is simply a, a quicker return on investment. But the Achilles heel for a quick, a quick uh, uptake and hence also for a, a dom for a good position at, in, in the global world of science are the metrics, the incentives uh, and the rewards. So let me quickly, in the, the four minutes, I hope that uh, Charlotte and she's Dutch, so three minutes, uh, <laughs> uh, leaves me is, is the following. So uh, we are working on what we call, uh, well, on, on a new way to try to measure how you can uh, have open science in the reward system, be it for careers, for, for researchers, for whatever people working on it, be it for funders in terms to evaluate uh, projects. And we are using uh, the work there of the Open Science Policy Platform, which is one of our uh, top-level ad ad advisory boards. And some of the recommendations, bringing together all the, the stakeholders, including the universities, and some of the recommendations that this, uh, that this board is now making, uh, has, been make, uh, has been making on, on this issue, uh, are there and are pretty straightforward, I think, for anyone who is uh, interested in the topic. The the advantages of the Open Science Policy Platform is that this kind of advice goes to the Competitiveness Council. It was mentioned in the beginning, the, 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 the Board of the Ministers. So tomorrow there will be a meeting, and we, we try to get an, a, a ministerial agreement on this kind of uh, uh, recommendation. So you see them there. It's, it's as you see, uh, the very, uh, make your indicators complementary, quantitative, qualitative. Uh, look at all research outputs, also data, also software, also algorithms. Um, have the indicators match with open science, do not use journal brand or impact factor or, or, or as a sole factor, and then uh, apply ORCID to develop, uh, best, pra uh, develop uh, best practices. Uh, how can we heal the heal? Eh? So what, is, what do we need to do to try to get out of this vicious circle? The system will only change if the rewards change, but the rewards will not change if the system doesn't follow. Well, we try, and I'm sorry to say, we try to work towards a declaration by, <laughs> sorry for the declaration, another one to add on the list of the <laughs> Austrian, <laughs> of the Austrian guy, but that's how it works eh, in politics. So we want to come together, we want to, uh, by, the, by the summer of next year or before, to have all the university associations, LERU, EUA, CESAR, uh, Coimbra, and so on, we want to have them to come together with all the funders, Science Europe plus those who are not in Science Europe, to agree on a set of indicators that complement the, high, the impact factor, so to speak, and which are a translation of open science. So uh, a no-brainer is, do you also deposit uh, uh, your, your data in uh, fair compatible repositories, and if so, in what intensity? I'm just inventing now something which will more or less be uh, there. So we are working there with an expert group to make sure that these indicators do not make the mistake of indicators in the past, so that they are generic enough to be applied across the fields, but also can be calibrated according to what kind of trajectory you do. Uh, we want to have that uh, signed so as a Bucharest declaration, and the key idea is that where the DORA declaration is, what don't we want? Uh, we do not want to be the system to be determined by the high impact factor. We want uh, now a declaration that says what do we want. And then the hope is, and it already happens in some of the papers that you can see, example for LEHU, the hope is that that is translated into evaluation criteria for researchers at universities and for funders in allocating money. At least we will apply some of these criteria in Horizon uh, Europe so that you, that you create the incentive. So that's a little bit trying to square the circle so that if you agree on new criteria, you can also uh, reward them by career evaluation track and by uh, incentives. So um, we are trying to do a same kind of exercise because I have 30 seconds left. <laughs> So a same kind of exercise in, um, together with our colleagues from DGEAC in making uh, the uptake of open science uh, parameters in the work of universities uh, an element in allocating funding for this um, 
a new approach to European universities and the European networks of universities. And for example, like suggested by Lehu, uh, if, you, if you appoint a senior manager to lead open science, that would be a positive factor in your evaluation for this kind of networks. By the way, I think every university should, uh, should uh, uh, apply, so should nominate a vice chancellor for open data, open science, whatever you call it. Uh, you have people working at that level on informatics 30 years ago. I think the same, the same should apply here. And then finally, so our, uh, it was also asked uh, to, to give a very, that's my last slide, Charlotte. Uh, so <laughs> so um, the, the open science policy platform is, it's, uh, is, is, so as I said, this high level advisory group. So we are now in the last phase of the commission. So also in the last phase of this commission, not the commission, I hope. Uh, so <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, she, they are winding up their activities. They are translating all their uh, proposals for uh, open science, which, is, uh, which are distributed over eight uh, priorities, open access, open data, and rewards and incentives, into a roadmap. Of, uh, they, are, they will mobilize across Europe the, the stakeholders to, trans, to translate that kind of propositions so that it becomes implementable. And then one of the last things they have to do is, of course, to provide an outlook for the next commission, what still has to be done. So in a nutshell, uh, uh, where we did a lot of work on open access, open data, on the hard part, so to speak, we did much less on the softer part because we simply don't have the mandate and we should not have the mandate. But we are trying to push, in particular, this... this uh, uh, this lockdown, if, if I can say so, on rewards, incentives, and metrics, because the three uh, go together. Without new metrics, no, no, new incent no new rewards, no new incentives. And then you can find all that in the uh, Open Science uh, Monitor, where, where it is uh, tracked. That is in a nutshell, and I hope in the time. Not quite, but uh, okay. I forget. Thank you for your presentation and giving an, an overview from the point of the European Commission. And it's also very fair of you to point out, okay, the hardware is there, but the software, this is where the Commission, but also together with all the part, partners, uh, needs to step up uh, the efforts. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to hear from uh, Ingeborg Meyer, and she's a senior researcher and research evaluation consultant within the Center for Science and Technology Studies at Leiden University. Ingeborg, the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I always hate these things. the other one the normal mic good um, I guess the reason that I'm here is uh, that I'm actively involved in open science um, actually the open science monitor that Jean-Claude uh, mentioned but also in open data uh, as a member of the research data alliance which is a global alliance on open data and also I'm pretty active in responsible research and innovation which was one of the policy initiatives in the European Commission as well so I'm fully pro-open uh, science, but uh, what I'm going to tell you here is a critical and a provocative uh, contribution, um, which hopefully I think leads to interesting discussions. Um, and it actually starts, and the reason for it is, um, for this critical opinion, is uh, my own personal career. Uh, and experience so far leads me uh, to think that um, cultural aspects in academia um, are pretty resistant to change, and I've experienced that myself. Um, as you can see, I started in uh, biomedical science at the top a long time ago, went to industry, uh, also went to policy, designed policy myself, aiming to change the world, did some consultancy in evaluating research and innovation uh, systems, and now went back to uh, academia in the social science department. And I actually returned for two reasons, to have the freedom to do projects and uh, to also uh, have uh, uh, spent time on studying the use of science in society, because I think that is my main ideal. And when returning, I found a uh, very traditional place with a whole set of written and unwritten 
rules. Um, that is not so free after all because of uh, disciplinary boundaries. It is full of people uh, who never worked outside academia. That's a bit of a worrisome as well. It is very individually uh, oriented and everybody's talking about collaboration and everybody's co-publishing, but the actual collaboration is really, really, really limited. There's hardly any teamwork. And it is not a tra very transparent system after all. Professors look for somebody like them in their appointing systems and you never get a feel, real good feeling why they've chosen one over the other. And then the whole system is publication, academic publishing based, really. Uh, so I think that's a bit of this introduction is need, is need because there are not so many people like me who are coming back in. So I can tell you the story from within and also compare to other working environments. Um, I do this three days per week in academia because I want to stay out and do other things as well. And I ha have to confess that I do my most innovative and interesting work outside academia, un unfortunately. And of course, the, tell is, the story that I'm going to tell is uh, with the disclaimer that this, of course, is not apl applicable. Our people are running ahead and really do interesting stuff, but this is about a really big, big, big group. So what is then, uh, causing this whole thing. When we talk about academic careers, uh, we talk, in fact, about the credibility cycle, which you see here. Um, it re basically revolves around getting recognition from your peers who value your publication or your work, your work through your publications. And the last 20 years, I think it's even more uh, getting, we get this kind of sub circle of recognition up there, which is almost fully based on scientometrics and bibliometric indicators. And the careers uh, depend on it, and it's not only the careers, it's the universities as well, because rankings depend on it as well. And on rankings, uh, people get to universities, so it's money, money related as well. So any policy initiative to turn attention and activities and rewards to, of academics to other things than publications, that have failed so far. And I think I must say that the European Commission has been very strong in trying to change policy and, and activities. It started with the topic of societal impact and then followed by the societal challenges, smart specialization, responsible research and innovation. Uh, and now we have the SDGs and all the initiatives really never, never uh, landed in academia. Well, sometimes lip service, but not really taking up the idea of bringing knowledge to the outside world. So, and every new policy is usually uh, connected uh, with indicators and monitoring systems to, of course, study the positive effects of a new policy. But most, most of the times, all these evaluations show that there's a really big gap between the policy and the actual practice. Because scientists think it is a burden and uh, they want to take, uh, all these policies want to take away academic freedom and they have the idea that excellent research will be picked up once it's published in a high impact journal, which is not read by everyone, I have to say. So I think this open science policy is very interesting because it hits the academic community where, uh, in, the, in the heart. And, um, so what is then this researcher's reality and how, would we, how will they react to, um, to um, open science? Well, the reality is that there's still very uh, stronghold for the journal impact factor and the age index, even though uh, repeatedly shown that they are not suitable indicators, but they pop up everywhere. Um, the publisher or parish is still a reality um, without a high number of publications, no grants uh, will be obtained which are, and for which there is a fierce competition and which uh, are required for tenure. So it's no wonder that scientists seek uh, refuge uh, to the predatory journals where they pay to be published. And successive temporary contracts in academia put researchers under permanent stress. Uh, and, and there is also a very, very, uh, uh, very meager academic career perspective. So there is not a lot of time to do other tasks. So everybody is doing 
what they have to do in order to survive the system and only those that comply survive in the system and by the time when you, are, when you think that you're there, then you think it's normal. So, um, of course, this affects the academic system and it's ob that's obvious and there are all kinds of signals uh, that tell how science goes wrong and that's also the reason that declarations like the DORA declaration and the Leiden Manifesto and the Metric Tide Report came out and stressed that we uh, should uh, be aware of the metrics and that we they call for responsible use of metrics. But even if we do, the actual question is what do we measure then? Is it that quality and what is quality of research actually about? Is that publications only? <coughs> So if we want to have a more uh, diverse uh, research um, uh, um, world and open science aims to bring this, uh, is that really able to change the world and the, t the system or not? So will open science help to a much more diverse set of researchers? I'm afraid it won't, working, won't be working that way. I have two, well, two examples of, of scientists who ask me, um, one was saying, I want to do, uh, in the tech school university, I want to do innovation and do other stuff. What do I have to do in order to be able to stay in? And I said, well, I'm afraid to say, but you have to publish, otherwise you will be out. Um, and there was another girl doing very interesting medical research, and she wanted to share that with other people than, their, than her academic peers. She wanted that the information was used by or doctors or whatever and she was thinking of a platform where this information could be shared so getting away from the publication system but open science is at, as, as, as it is right now is not giving that um, will it help to improve the integrity and reproducibility if you look at that paper on top in nature it is telling you that uh, the biotech industry has serious problems in reproducing high impact publication findings. So it is a very serious problem for taking the patents that are developed within academia and developing it into new products. Um, so a high impact publication is just a high impact publication for a career very often. Uh, and which not peer is actually reading a publication in the first place? Have you ever tried to read it when it's not your field? It's almost incomprehensible. So if this whole idea of citizen science, who is going to read the publication? We have to really change our, our way of communication and expanding it uh, and extending it to, to other uh, uh, platforms as well. Um, and I think I can show that here by showing that a lot of the Wikipedia um, uh, papers that do reference uh, scientific publication, that's really very low percentage, below 1% of the publications is showing up in Wikipedia. Although I must say that open access publications are more cited there. Open data is even worse. 30% of the scientists do not really um, uh, share their data and 30% publish their data alongside or as tables in their publication. So open data is not daily practice for most of the researchers except in very data intensive fields. Um, another thing, open is not for free. We at CWTS have a lot of uh, uh, workings with the different databases from the Web of Science, uh, Scopus, but also of uh, with unpayable and we always have to pay licenses because keeping up a system like that, like this costs money one way or the other. So um, if we are in this locked in situation and I see there's still a, a lot of world to win because the gray area is not open access yet, and this is a picture that comes from the um, uh, open science, except for the pink elephant. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's still a, wor a world in, um, and the question is, will that change uh, academic uh, culture? And I'm afraid, not from my own experience, I'm an exception in a uh, flock of scientists 
that are all caught by the excellence trap. Um, it means that research and innovation seems to drift further apart. Uh, and the last thing on the bottom of the slide is a publication in the Atlantic which shows that there is a bigger uh, gap and divide between research and innovation. That's actually what my colleague finds as well in his uh, trying to connect patents and publications. So, to conclude, I think it is fair to say that without acknowledging this um, pink elephant in the room, we cannot open up the discussion. We need to discuss what we think is quality and we also need to consider the idea that there is quality without publications. And then the question is that follows from that is what reward and incentive schemes fit with a diverse, inclusive and responsible academic system? And the question is, is this going to be uh, need, does it need an incremental or a disruptive thing? So how does the uh, open science modus operandi takes into account the pink elephant in the room? That's my question to the, to the audience. So thank you for your attention. Stay this, this was definitely 15 minutes, but uh, I forgive you. Okay. okay, so thank you so much for your contribution and also for sharing your personal story. I think that's very helpful to have this kind of story uh, telling. And we will be coming back to this big uh, pink elephant in the room later on during the panel discussion. It is now my great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to you Gareth O'Neill, President of the European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers, also known as Eurodoc. Works, it does. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, so hello. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I think if you talk about openness, you should be open. So there's a QR code here. You can scan it or take the picture and scan it afterwards or type in the Google short link there. This will give you access to this automatically. There's links in there you can click, so I won't refer to them. And if somebody gets in, could you put up your hand so I at least know it's, it is open? I have a. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to go for the record on this one. I'll give it 15 more seconds. You can take a picture and then you have the short link or you can scan the QR code from the picture. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move on. So I'm going to probably echo what's been said before this uh, to some extent. Uh, who are we? So uh, this isn't me, obviously. I'm here speaking for 29 national associations uh, called Eurodoc. So basically it's an umbrella and this goes all the way down to grassroots level. So our national members, um, one of them is here, for instance, from Azerbaijan, uh, have members at usually university level going all the way down to faculty institute and then even individual members. So we don't claim to speak for all of them, but in many cases we are the de facto stakeholder to speak for them across Europe. And when I say Europe, I mean the Council of Europe, so 47 countries. Um, this is run completely by volunteers, so under me there are 36 people in our administration. Uh, they all work for free, as in free beer, uh, and not getting free beer. Uh, and they basically do this uh, on a voluntary basis. We get funded from our members, which is not a lot, so our budget is quite limited. Um, and we develop and help these policies uh, through working groups, events, uh, attending meetings like this and so forth. Now, I'm going to put this into context because it's not all about open science. Science happens within a context. And the issues for early career researchers are, for instance, most of them, maybe between 70-80%, depending on the discipline, must leave academia. This is a reality, a statistical fact. However, when you ask them, do you want to stay, on the top left there, they will say yes, 70 plus percent, if not 80 in some fields. So there is a huge uh, difference between what's actually going to happen and what these people want. And this hits them very hard, usually towards the end of the PhD. When we ask them then, are you getting trained for non-academia or are you getting career counseling? Uh, are you being put in contact with future employers? Um, you see very low percentages. So it's between 15 and 30 percent saying they're getting some kind of uh, training and support to get out of academia. So this is a harsh reality and the question here is if we're going to do open science What relevance is that for these people? Can they use open science and benefit from it in non-academia in industry? 
Uh, then we get to the open research paradigm. And in many cases, early career researchers are more or less fully behind this. They've grown up with Facebook. Their whole private lives are open. So moving on towards data is not such a huge step. However, they have no idea what open science really is and how to do it. So a survey we did last year with the commission. Blue is I know quite a lot. Red is I know something. Uh, and you can see that they know something about open access, open data, open source, and then it nose dives. So, and then when we ask them further, are you getting trained for this? Are you getting supported by a help desk or by specialist support? We see it's less than 25% in all cases that they're actually getting help in open science. So on the one hand, they're being asked to do it. On the other hand, they don't know what it is. They don't know how to do it and they're not getting supported. And this is a crucial aspect if we're going to move forward. And then the final thing is, as I've said, it's not just the research. They have to train, get new skills to go into acad outside academia. They have to now start learning about open science, about implicit bias, about gender equality, about research integrity, you name it, the list keeps continuing. And we get to the issue, and the big elephant in the room is the mental health issues in academia. Study done in uh, Flanders, you can see when they were asked statistically, how many of you feel under constant strain? It was 40%. How many of, you show, how many of them were showing signs of clinical depression? It's around 30%. So phenomenally high for this population. The study was repeated uh, in Leiden, and the figures were even worse. Uh, so there's clearly an issue here. And again, if you're piling up all of these skills training and all of these uh, tasks and activities that need to be done, then this needs to be taken into account. So we can do open science, but how are we going to do this that no, everybody doesn't go crazy? So we move towards open science, and it's very specific, really, uh, at the moment, what we're talking about. Open science is a whole paradigm of access, data, education, evaluation, licensing, uh, citizen science, you name it, it's a whole shopping list. But basically, right now, we're talking about open access and open data, even more specifically, fair data. And what we see is the huge uh, other elephant in the room is uh, the academic reward system. They are, there is an obsession, obsessive uh, focus on the journal impact factor <coughs> and on the H-index, and not just for excellence, but basically research and career evaluations are focused on this. So if we're going to move to open science, then that journal impact factor is have, going to have to be uh, destroyed and removed. Then we get into the discussion of how to judge excellence. Maybe we see that in the panel. But in any case right now, for us, open access is focusing quite heavily, obviously, on Plan S. What is this? How is it going to affect us? How can we uh, get involved in the consultation? And when we talk about open data, specifically here we talk about fair data because of the argument in openness. We accept that there may be uh, criteria not to open, for instance, national security, privacy, commercial interest. Uh, and in any case, what we want is fair data for now to be supported and helped trained in this and to do this so that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and that we have these DMPs to help us do this and support at the institutions. I'm going to stop it there. Thanks a lot, Gareth, also for your contribution. And this shows you that the discussion on open science is not as easy as it seems to be. If you go a couple of levels deeper, you kind of get stuck. But that's something that we would like to tackle also in the panel discussion. But before that, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the last speaker, and that is Monique Ritchie, the co-chair of the Open Science Working Group of Yeron, and Yeron is the Young European Research Universities Network. The floor is yours. Right. Um, is this okay? Excellent. Lovely. I'll do my best to stick to time, and I have a short video at the end, actually, if um, we do have time to show it. Um, my background is on the ground. I'm working with researchers directly in my in own institution, and um, this is my experience here is something that I'm bringing to my position as co-chair of the Year in Open Science Working Group. Now, Yeren is working very hard at the moment to make sure that our members are working together and um, on open science initiatives and are feeding, we're hoping to feed into policy development. Now, some of the practical things that we have done in the group, um, and some of this predates my joining the group earlier this year. Um, Yirin has published a statement on open science, and all of these statements are open access. You can find them online. 
um, and that the statement outlines year and strategy to deliver open science, to support open science among member institutions and wider. It sets out the objectives that we hope to achieve. The position statement on Plan S um, also provides our uh, assessment of what the plan means and how we might wish to influence uh, its development. And certainly we know that our feedback has been taken on board because we can see it reflected in the guidelines that was published um, earlier um, a few days ago. We are also working with um, um, the European Commission. We have um, my fellow co-chair, Professor Eva Mendes, is working on the Open Science Platform. Euron is chairing this, this group. So we have a direct connection, I think, to um, the people who have power and authority to influence open science developments and policies. And the working group also, on a practical basis, works with the community. And this is really important to progress open science in our own institutions. To do so, we have to establish a baseline of um, what is actually going on. How is open science being delivered uh, across the um, universities that are part of the network? And um, we've done so earlier this year by conducting a self-assessment, which was, went out to all members. And the results are not yet published, but we hope to do so soon. Uh, but there were quite interesting results. Open science was very clearly shown as something that um, is being supported in, in institutions but there are ways in which they can be improved and progressed. There is still uh, fragmentation, I suppose, and um, every institution is different. We also work with, within the community to facilitate ways in which we can get together and share what we are doing in a practical sense to support open science. So this is what initiatives we are doing, what, what, what advocacy and training we're providing in our own institutions. And we do so through uh, mechanisms like the uh, Members General Assembly, which we had recently at Brunel, my institution, in September. There'll be a rector's meeting in the spring, in March next year. And, um, and we do have regular face-to-face -face and online contact. So um, that's very important. And on a more practical level, year and plans to work with um, the community on benchmarking and hopes to introduce an Open Science Excellence Award to reward researchers for who practice good open science. This is still something that is, is, is in the making. It's not yet delivered, but it's on the roadmap to develop further this year. Uh, when it comes to career promotion and research evaluation, Universities play a key role, I think, in embedding open science within their institutions. We are a very diverse community, and each institution has very different needs and cultures, and it can be very difficult to establish a policy framework that works across and supports that diversity. So it translates that this will also have implications for embedding open science in things like rewards and incentives and career promotion. So I think our role at, at Yeren is to work together as a community to really try and establish what our differences are across the sector and try and find a standardised way of making sure that we can deliver those rewards and incentives, deliver, de develop a framework which we can recommend to our members as a way to move forward um, in this sense. And... Um, we also know that researchers are, they move around, they change institutions. So again, as we heard in, earlier, in the earlier session, we need to have common standards and practices, and this is globally. It, it's not going to just be in our own institutions or even in our network. So that is crucial. We need to be working together so that we can shape uh, shared policies and infrastructure that work for all of us or the majority of us at the very least. With rewards and incentives, they help raise researchers' awareness of open science principles um, 
and I think as such we need to do a lot more within our institutions and, um, and within the network to encourage the, the adoption of good practice. So one way to do that is perhaps to introduce a stick versus carrot approach. Now the stick is something that you, 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 know, you, you hit someone on the back with, the carrot is what you use to entice. So how do we play it? It might be that both methods might be useful in tandem, stick first, carrot, stick first, next, then carrot, to keep it going. But uh, one approach may not work for all, and it can vary by disciplines. The Open Science Excellence Award is an example of a carrot, perhaps, and uh, something that can promote open science. If researchers can see the benefits for them in real terms, this is something that really helps move things forward. Embedding open science in researcher performance management processes. Um, performance management is something that happens in every institution, I, I think. And um, in, my, in my institution, we look at uh, how open science is being delivered, really. And using that to feed into the academic promotion process. So um, this is one example of how it can be moved forward there. Employer reward schemes also encourage goodwill. And you can have things like flexible policies for researchers who engage in, in open science and can demonstrate their open science engagement. Um, having extended research leave and education leave to support all of the activities that they are undertaking in, their instit in, in our institutions. And um, advocacy and engagement is, is something that helps change the culture. It is also an incentive in many ways and we, in my institution, we definitely go out and try to encourage academics to see the benefits of open science for them. This is what it means for them. It helps to extend their research. It can help them reach a wider audience and generate impact and influence. And um, when they understand that, they engage a lot more. With recruitment, uh, research open science is already being used uh, across many institutions to um, that it's factored into the recruitment process, so academics may need to come in and show that their <coughs> publications are already open, show evidence to the interview panel. And this is something, again, that's picked up annually in the, um, in the performance review pro process or evaluation process. It's also important for open science policies and practices um, to be in place, to be eligible for research funding. And one of the things that we know is happening already in the UK, at least, that um, open science is not really an option. It is a very big part of the research assessment there, and certainly across Europe for many other funders, it's also key. So it's, um, there's nowhere to hide. I think it's, it's definitely something that is um, taking off. And metrics have been mentioned already, using them responsibly um, and not, to, not in ways which um, excludes research groups is very important. They can help show impact, reach and influence, but shouldn't be used to judge individual researchers. So I'm not sure if this is going to work, but... Um, how should I play this? My God. So the idea is I'll leave you with a short, short video. It's a couple of minutes. Yes. I don't know. Ah, there we go. I think we will share it with the participants. <laughs> yes. It's open access, so you can find it online. But <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Speakers to join me on stage. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, the, oh, yeah. Thank you. Is there an order? There's a. I made a small order. Yeah. You're allowed to sit oh, next to me. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much once again for your contributions. And um, perhaps I would already like to start with this big 
pink elephant in the room. And just to put it very bluntly, it seems to be there's, there is already enough policy out there. But a couple of levels deeper, this is where you find, I would say, a kind of the problem. So, um, Ingeborg, can you elaborate on that? We can talk about that we want to have research performance management review processes. That's more on the policy side. That's something that we should do. It doesn't say that's something that we must do. What is your take on that? Does that work? Um, w well, there are, of course, different levels where you can influence the system, as you said, the carrot and the stick. So um, on the stick side, I would say that funders um, could play a, a big role there in the sense that they can bring on uh, many other perspectives in the evaluation of research proposals, forcing researchers to be more open and more inclusive and more also aware of what their contribution should be. So that's on the funder level. Uh, we have been, uh, I've been experimenting with that with the Dutch Hearts uh, Foundation, with alternative types of evaluation. Uh, so that's on the on the on the carrot uh, the stick side. On the carrot side, I think within the universities at the university board uh, level, I think there is a real big um, um, world to win because the people that are now chairing the universities, uh, to put it bluntly, are the ones who survived through the system and are very good at it. So they look for people that they even think when they when they heard the, the the results from the mental well-being, they said, well, those are the ones we don't want in the system anyway. <laughs> so it is it is really bad because what you create is a is an army of of scientists that are all doing the same, and you want to have other people in yeah. as well. So I think it would be helpful, uh, and I'm and I'm for that. I'm not sure where to start, but I would say that uh, the uh, the European organisations um, uh, should address this uh, in their work and not not putting out recommendations and 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 suggestions and new policies, but actually changing themselves as but well. Th that that's the difficult part, of course, because that's if people have an approach of surviving the system, then change is never going to happen. No. Um, Gareth, to come to you, you said, well, one of the things, of course, you can design policy, but this needs to be understood by the researchers themselves as well. You said there's a basic knowledge about open access, open data, but it kind of stops there. So how can you more, from the young researchers perspective, incentivize them um, to use open science uh, initiatives? Well, move away from the journal impact factor and start rewarding them for these activities that they do and just be maybe be clear on what is meant by open science basically they mean the future of science mm -hmm. not not the science that is open versus science that will be closed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that means all of the activities that are included under that research is one part of the researcher's life there is also supervision of students there is also teaching of students examinations <laughs> conference visits all these other things that researchers uh, have to do. Okay. So the question then is, how do you reward them? You start rewarding them for all of these activities. Mm. I can give a specific example from Leiden, uh, which is a small step towards that. Usually the research uh, <coughs> professor, so in the Netherlands it's a chair, you apply for a position and then you can get accepted. Uh, and in the Netherlands then, mostly it's research professors who have high impact publications that make tenure not the individuals doing a lot of the teaching and who don't actually get to do a lot of research or publish in high-impact factor journals. So they've now created a kind of two-track system where one is the standard research professor and the other is a leader in education. Somebody that has perhaps done a lot more teaching, gets high evaluations, does blended learning and create programs. It's a small step, but you, you could actually include a lot more other uh, topics there, not just through open science. Okay. I know at the commission they have what's called the Open Science Career Assessment Matrix, yep. the OSCAM. That's also a shopping list of all these activities, uh, which I think needs to be developed, but that could be a start moving towards what are these other activities. But we still get to the question then of how do you judge excellence? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, we won't have a big discussion right now specifically on judging excellence because we could organize a different panel debate <laughs> on that uh, for sure. Perhaps to stay a little bit with this uh, open science career assessment metrics, uh, well, Jeroen, you have published your own 
uh, Yiran has co published its own commitments on, on, uh, on open science. Um, do you see the value in this open science career assessment uh, metrics uh, yourself as well? Absolutely. Um, it covers so many areas from research integrity um, right through to open data. Um, and all of those things are part of what researchers have to do every day. And um, they may not realize it. It's part of the criteria that is used to determine who gets the funding now. So they are having to find ways to deliver on that, to qualify for it in the first place. So actually, they are getting on, on track somehow. But it's what do we then do to sustain it and support them? so that they, uh, they don't leave academia. Um, so, so the feedback you get from the researcher uh, themselves is they do value such a matrix. It gives them a little bit of uh, um, a substance of what they need to work on in their yes, careers. Yes, because they can yeah. then see how it translates to them securing funding. Okay. So, yeah. so the policy environment they're working in is helping. Okay, thank that. you. Jean-Claude, um, you already mentioned, uh, well, you've, you've, you've published many policy documents, uh, declarations, you name it. Now it's the next phase. It's more the soft side of open science. To what extent can the European Commission actually play a role and where does your mandate stop? Well, the, the, man the mandate stops because it's subsidiarity, which is, I'm sure you all know what it is. <laughs> which is what you can, it's a policy principle in the Commission that what you can do at the national level should be done at the national level, which is a correct principle. And education, the organization of research is one of it. So in terms of real power, uh, the, what we can do is what we can do as a funder like any other funder. And that's, that's what I want to say at the end before I, I lost my minute. <laughs> uh, is, is <laughs> that's why we have a debate now. <laughs> <laughs> so that we try to inject as much as possible of this kind of criteria in what we will use as funding criteria for Horizon Europe in, in 2020. But if I may pick up on what, yes, what was, was said, I think, I think we have to realize that if we wait until all this spontaneously evolves to a situation whereby everyone happily accepts these things, then we wait a long time. I mean, researchers are driven by, 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 by money and by recognition. Recognition can be in, in journals, in articles, and, and, in, and in careers. So we have to tweak the system so that recognition and money just takes into account uh, open science. But there is one, if I may... And, and then I'm recognition ha needs to be changed as well, as, as Gareth pointed out. It shouldn't just depend on the, on the impact factor, but on other factors as no, well. No, you, you, for example, you, you, I think open peer review is, is almost as valid as, as open publication. I can, I can have a big talk on that, but let's assume you agree with that. Well, that should become a factor in your evaluation. I'm a fantastic open peer reviewer. But there is one thing missing, and then I conclude. I think we should also not forget to, to show the researchers the, how powerful open science is. The reason why I got interested in it is because you see what open data and interoperability can do in terms of quality of science so that they, can, that they see it as an enhancement of their, of their scientific activity rather than a, burden, a burdening framework. And I, I remember one, one day in, in, in Delft University, so they had, they had eight showcases from all their faculties, how open data, open access and so forth, improve the quality and the speed of their science. And that's an extremely powerful uh, argument towards science. And then they will take all the rest as well, you know. But then it's in, in a way, it's also uh, a communication issue if you can present this kind of storytelling uh, to researchers out there, then that might incentivize them uh, to change their attitude to open science it's as well and to embrace it better. It's a pedagog pedagogical issue, just like when the, 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 the first worked uh, per packages were introduced to manipulate text on a computer, you got training from your university, you know. So I, I, in that respect, I think the, the roadmap of Leru in how to make open science a management practice in universities is, is should be an inspiration for all the associations because they really detail 32 recommendations yep. like this kind of thing, you know. And then to appoint an open science manager. Uh, That's what they indeed uh, propose, uh, yes. The academic institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to open up the floor to you. Um, are there any questions from your site? Can you please state your name and affiliation? Thank you. So hello, I'm uh, Daniel Spichtinger. I used to work for Jean-Claude um, and now I'm back in Austria working for the uh, Ludwig Boltzmann Gesellschaft and also as an independent expert. 
And uh, in the six years that I had the pleasure to work on open access, in fact, I also came to the conclusion that the, the rewards and incentives, that is really the key. Because you can have many sticks, but um, then people comply because they have to and they will find ways around and uh, do as little as possible. But if you make it in their own interest, then they will do open access because it's useful for their advancement. Well, they will give their full effort to that because that will help them secure uh, their tenure. But what I also found out that there, for me, it's very strange. It's not strange, but it took me a while to realize why is this impact factor uh, fixation so uh, pervasive across all countries, although there is no real standardization on how researchers are evaluated. Still, wherever you go, you have impact factor. And for me, this is because universities themselves are also evaluated. Mm -hmm. And they are not only evaluated by the REF, but we have these nice rankings, Shanghai, Times Higher Education, and they all want to uh, you know, say we are in the top 10 or top 50. And these rankings use these impact factors. So because they are going to be evaluated on that, they themselves say, well, we are going to our, evaluate our professors, and the professors are saying, we are going to evaluate our PhD students on that. So it's a kind of vicious circle that is very difficult to break. And so my question to the panel would be, do you see a way to break that? Could uh, EU legislation be a way to break that? Has anyone ever been in contact with the rankings? And just to finish off, I remember the Th that's EU... That's three uh, questions already, yeah? All right, <laughs> okay. I'll finish that. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Because <laughs> otherwise it might be a little bit too much to, to take in. Who would like to take the floor? Well, the rankings, uh, I should say something about that, because CDOTS is uh, publishing their Leiden ranking every year, which I think is a bit of a... We shouldn't do that, actually, in a way, if we don't want to. I, I hope you talk in your personal capacity, then. Yes. <laughs> well, no, actually, I have a lot of colleagues who say that this shouldn't be ours to do. But still, there is so much attention from the field for the, for the impact factors and all the institution, all institutional evaluations uh, build upon the bibliometric analysis. And we have a lot of requests on how we can tweak their <coughs> results in such a way that they come out better. So. That's the other side of the of the of the story, um, but it would be better if we if we if we pay less attention to um, to rankings in that respect. But the truth of the fact is that a lot of international students do look at um, rankings and they do cho choose the universities on the basis of rankings, which is based on the publication system. Mm -hmm. And uh, any international st student coming into university does represent a considerable amount of money. So it is an economic uh, consideration as well. So not so easy to break, but it is, it is, it is keeping the system alive. Yeah. So I'm looking for, for these, uh, the entry points to change the system as well all the yeah. time. So I'm happy to hear your opinion on that. Exactly. So you, you do recognize there's a problem, yes. but still we don't have a solution to the yeah. problem. Uh, Monique, do you have any solution? How can we move away from just the impact factor and then consequently also think about a, a new model when it comes to rankings and the way uh, students and, and uh, academia look at uh, those universities and how well they perform? I think it's a very difficult thing to tackle. It's um, not going to be easy as well, I agree. Um, I think one of the most radical ways in which you can tackle it is perhaps to collectively decide to boycott rankings and not use them, make a declaration to not use them to go forward in and, and to inform your, um, your policies. But the fact is that universities also want to be able to show how they're doing. They need to find some sort of measure and perhaps as a community, we need to get together and decide, you know, how do we do that? How do we build on that? What indicators do we need to take this forward? And there is a lot of work I know being done. The European Commission is, is working on, on indicators. So it's, we need to take those and move forward and work together at finding a, a collective solution. So I don't have the answer either, but I think the role for year in here is to coordinate and advise and make recommendations based on feedback. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, just do a quick survey with you right now. 
based on the discussions, would you be in favor now of abolishing or boycotting rankings? Just put your hand up. No, oh, you're still very cautious. Yeah, slowly we're getting there, 30, 40%. Okay, thank you. Jean-Claude, you wanted to add a point and then yeah. I'll take some questions. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake you up. I'm in favor of rankings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you should tweet that, but I'm in favor of findings, and I will explain you why. I think, first of all, it is, I mean, I'm also, I also agree that the fixation on the high impact factor, that, that, that's wrong, because it is too, it's too simple, and we should make it broad, and we can do that. We can develop new indicators. But why do rankings exist? I mean, it is an, an illusion to think that in the old days of science, you know, say you go 200 years ago, there were no rankings. There was, of course, no Shanghai Index because Shanghai didn't exist. But, but, but uh, people used to rank amongst themselves and they m met each other in the, in the academies and in the royal societies to classify verbatim. That's good, you should put your son there and so on. So a way of classification is, is a natural thing that what people do. Otherwise, how, how would you do it? And don't forget, in the meantime, the science system has exploded. It's no longer a few universities in the UK and on the mainland and in the, in, later in the US. It's now, what is it, 30,000 universities? That, and and how, we, how do you find your way in 30,000 universities if you want to find your way? Well, you, you rank. Use, you rank, of course. Ah. The point is that the rankings are too <laughs> monocausal and are too simple. We should make them multidimensional and, and richer. But ranking, I mean, if, if, if you go out here and you want to find a restaurant, what do you do? You go on Yelp and you look at the stars. No? And I'm sure you will not go to somewhere where there is no star. So <laughs> it is a, it's a natural thing of, of doing it. it. It is a tool, but... The tool should not be developed perverse, and it should be a richer tool. Thank you for that comment. Yes, Camilla. I tend to agree with Jean-Claude on that. I think journal impact factors are a great way how to evaluate journals and to compare them to each other or publishing programs uh, to each other. They're probably not a great way to evaluate researchers on it. No. But. As Jean-Claude says, we need something relatively simple to evaluate researchers or publications or data sets, etc. And now speaking you know, like from a researcher's perspective, putting that hat on, we want to be read. I mean, <coughs> if we publish an article or if we publish a data set and nobody's using it or reading this article, citing this article, downloading it, we're actually quite disappointed. Uh, researchers on our platform at least sit there and click the button, am I being read? You know, like, am I getting a dot from uh, Rome, Paris, Shanghai, wherever? Um, so I think there's nothing, nothing wrong with actually having quantitative metrics to guide decision making. They shouldn't replace any reading of papers or any qualitative assessments. But if you need, if you have a hundred candidates you actually need to narrow it down or a thousand candidates for a position or for a, fund, a funding proposal or you know like to judge an, uh, an author you actually need to narrow it down with a couple of of metrics for us you know like what we think a simple solution is rather than focusing on the journal impact factors really just focus on the views the downloads and the citations of an individual article and you can aggregate that as well for researchers not to lose anything else out of perspective. You know, like still need to read the thing, you still need to talk to the person to evaluate who that actually is. But it's a very, very simple metric that can be that can be useful. And you can put it, you know, like with the type of technology that exists today into perspective and into relation. Uh, is that in this academic discipline or in another academic discipline, is, are the age ranges similar? Because somebody who is 60 obviously has many more citations than somebody who's just starting off a career. So all of these types of metrics can be put together so you can use them as a help, as a tool uh, to do the initial evaluation. Okay, thank you for that comment. Can I respond? Yes, you can respond. I, yeah. just, I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with everything you said, but I fundamentally disagree with the idea that it should be simple and one single metric. Mm. And the question is, why have we moved towards this over-quantification? Now, my personal opinion is that you know, the ivory tower is dead and gone. Uh, it's been gone for decades. And this is just following on from what's happened over 30 years plus across Western Europe, which is the, the movement towards corporate management implementation in universities. So now we speak of presidents and boards 
and directors and managing directors of financial controllers and meetings and so forth. And people are c getting more and more judged on these metrics because the drive is towards efficiency and obviously saving money. And we've gone from a student system where students are learning in an environment to customers who are paying for education with demands. And that's how it's moving. So now we're looking for simple ways to uh, judge these people. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, then we come back to a library mechanism for libraries to know how to, which journals to buy in because of popularity. And that has now been applied on researchers' actual output. So that's a fundamentally flawed system. And I think we should be moving away from the quantification and the metricization towards qualification. So looking at what they're actually doing, not necessarily just in terms of simple bean counting uh, numbers. Okay, thank you. So according to you, the, simple, the, the system is not that simple. No. Yeah. I would say we need contextualization within diff within, between diff disciplines, between countries, um, between uh, 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 technologies, because it's, it, it, they behave different. The, the uh, publication cultures are different. Uh, but I've seen so many organizations uh, approaching us uh, and I've seen so many perverse uh, uh, effects of simple indicators that that definitely isn't the way to go. Okay, so and the only way to do it probably is to take ownership collectively and that it's a shared responsibility exactly. among funders, uh, public uh, organizations, academia yeah. and so on. Okay, I think there was another question in the back. François Busquet, Cat Europe, uh, University of Constance. To, to react to what was said previously, there are uh, plumics analytics and alt metrics that already help to capture a few of uh, what you mentioned. Yeah. And now if I put my hat as a GSC alumni, so the Joint Research Center, I think there is an element that was not uh, uh, present here, is that there is this GRC strategy from 2030. And in the Annex 2, they already um, detail how scientific recognition can, or scientific excellence can be uh, assessed with production and we have the scientific uh, publication whether it's open access or not but also um, let me read because I don't know it by heart the, uh, the scientific recognition you can have also the outreach activities you can uh, have prize and awards and you have also the, the sharing when you're organizing uh, scientific events or etc so these are three pillars of excellence that could be used also for the assessment and cover most of uh, what was uh, discussed today okay thank you for this uh, remark uh, there's can a I, question can I com comment on <coughs> yes you may um, I, I, I really agree with you. Uh, with regard to all of metrics, I'm not so sure, but with regard to all the other types of outreach, they are in fact now included in the self uh, 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 the standard evaluation protocol that uh, evaluates Dutch universities. It's a kind of a ref, uh, except that, that no money is connected to it. So we have three pillars, research quality, societal relevance and then viability. For societal relevance, there's a whole range of different types of outputs that can be listed and can be uh, shown to, to be evaluated on. And I've, sit, I've been sitting in, in several evaluation committees and it's in the reports, in the self evaluation reports, it's been presented. And then the evaluation committee comes in and they don't discuss it at all. It doesn't play, it hardly, it doesn't play is, is a bit too much, but it, it is maybe 10% of the time is spent on it. The rest of the time is devoted to all the other things. So it is in, in every element of the system, you have to be aware that these things are happening all the time. So I, I would plea for a much more inclusive system where external stakeholders play a much bigger part in all those aspects of, of, of judgment and assessment. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Well, I think the beauty of open science and of the technologies beyond it, uh, underlying it, is that you can trace and measure everything. Everything you do as a scientist. Mm -hmm. It's not only your article at the end, who is published, which is published two years after you finished, but you can in real time trace what you do, be it data production, be it open peer review, be it repository, be it your software, and you can be it your impact. And the, the key thing is now to do that in an as I would say as, as broad a way as possible. And then as a, as a recruiter or as a funder, you can tailor this. You say, okay, I need a guy who is, or a lady who is f strong in outreach, I ask those indicators. I need a guy who is, lady f who is very strong in, in, 
basic research, youth, and then you get another kind of indicator. That's the beauty of the system. Mm -hmm. So that's why it should be as broad as possible, and as Ger Gerrit said, not, not single uh, single issue. Okay, thank you. Monique, you also wanted to comment, right? Yes, just a brief point, um, and li just listening to the comments. Um, a proposal for an alternative to metrics, perhaps all we need is the data, and our research community can go away and crunch that data and come up with its own assessment. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a solution. <laughs> That's great. You should Thank copyright you. it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we're going to take one final question from the audience before we're running out of time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank for all the panelists. It was a very diverse and, and great uh, session. I enjoyed very much the diversity. Uh, my name is Susanna Bodi, coming from European Network of Living Labs. And um, ourselves as, a, as an organization, we contributed to the open science policy platform discussions, but also very much interested in the citizen science part. Uh, today or tonight, we rather heard uh, feedbacks when it comes to the representation of researchers, publicists and uh, founders, uh, but I, I, I lacked uh, a little bit when it comes to the re receiver side, so really opening up data, opening up science for all. Uh, we do feel that there is really a big gap still how research is translated to citizens like average people. And there is a big criticism coming when it comes to investment in research and how it's embedded or, or normal citizens are benefiting from it. We do believe that there is definitely benefit for all, but it's really the message or the translation which we find very difficult. And we are working on it with trial error uh, projects, but I would like to hear your opinion that when it comes to your field and background, how do you see as a next step what, what can be done also to uh, engage this part of society and not just academia. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. And one of the reasons why we haven't really discussed that is because, well, we have confined it to the open uh, science uh, academic system. But of course, very good question. Who would like to answer? Citizen science, how to involve citizens. I'm a linguist. Um, we've been engaging citizens for over 100 years plus now. We go to communities, we write up grammars and we've been trying to give something back to them which is usually a grammar although that's not so relevant in many cases uh, if they can't read uh, but we have been moving towards for instance giving something credible and tangible back so in communities with dying languages giving them something back to help train and keep the language in the children and so forth but we've been doing this for decades so maybe a wrong example Okay, thank you, uh, Gareth. Um, then, uh, as a final question, we haven't really discussed Horizon Europe a lot yet. Um, however, Jean-Claude pointed out a couple of... Yeah, you can just lay back <laughs> and relax. Uh, you've done your part, exactly, Jean-Claude. Um, so you, you've already outlined your plans for Horizon Europe, uh, how you would like to see an uptake of open science. However, I'd also like to hear from, uh, from Monique and Gareth and from Ingeborg, uh, what would be your main message uh, that you would like to convey to the European Commission, but also to the Parliament, to the Council, when it comes to providing incentives and rewards to promote open science practices in the context of Horizon Europe. And if you can do it in one sentence, uh, I would be very grateful. Um, well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, broadening up requires also uh, <coughs> lessening of excellence, because there's, for me, there's a long time battle between impact and excellence going on. So loosening the excellent uh, thing, which is an inflated word anyway. Okay, thank you. <laughs> One sentence, I'm a linguist there, so <laughs> I can drag this out. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't say anything directly to Jean-Claude now. We've said what okay. we want to say. We do this openly, but what That's I would say... That's why we have reception afterwards. Yeah. What yeah. I would say is um, that this shift towards uh, moving away from GIF, for instance, is not just a policy instrument. This is an implicit bias built into researchers. You can put this through grants and, uh, and everything else in research and career evaluation, but people will still implicitly fall back on it if you want to compare it to gender equality, for instance. Yeah. So it's going to take a lot more than just setting up policy instruments. People are going to have to literally train and change that mind shift. Changing attitudes. Monique. And I think only I would say to continue the consultation with uh, key stakeholders and not forgetting the need to recognize diversity in the policy framework. So to find something that will work for most and that also recognizes um, young career researchers okay. as well. Thank you. Then final, final part. 
In one word for you, Jean-Claude, what do you need from your fellow panel members for Horizon Europe? Well, I would tell them... One word. Stop. Stop. <laughs> you know, I, I, would, I would tell them, don't wait for the commission, just do it. Okay, very good. Just do it, as Nike has always said to yeah, do so. Exactly. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a big hand to our panel. <laughs> <coughs> okay, and uh, I'd like to give the floor now That's to nice. Fred for Thanks. the closing ah. remarks. Thank you, Monique. Oh, Very thank nice. You. Jean Claude, thank it was you. always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Monique. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the University of Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Fred Pentland. I'm the executive editor at Frontiers, um, and it's my it's my pleasure this evening to have to have the last word before we move to the, the aperitif. Uh, I I really cannot help but starting by just thanking a few important people. Michelle, shout out to Lee, Florian, and the speakers, um, and and thanks also to all the participants. I thought the the explosive discussion that spontaneously emerged after the first round sort of suggests the fact that we're really onto a, uh, onto, a, onto a subject that resonates so strongly with, with all of us. Um, so thank you to the participants, and also a special thanks to Laure Sanier for all the work that she's done to really make this a, uh, a real happening, a successful event. Um, uh, if there's one, one, the first lesson I learned today, I, I sat back, I've been taking notes uh, uh, all afternoon. The first lesson is never give more than six minutes to a speaker. There's no reason. Uh, it was absolutely amazing how uh, the, uh, very strong messages came across in six minutes. And I think this is something, this is, this is the first take, take home message. Um, <laughs> No, I think what Professor Hengartner, he, there's one thing that he said that, uh, that, that, that uh, set off a, a, a series of reflections in my mind, very simple statement, change is hard. And uh, we, we, the, we heard various, uh, various uh, articulations of this message throughout, throughout the afternoon. It very much resonates with the idea that for us who have been working to, in this open science arena for so long, that this has really taken on the sense of a mission. You know, change is hard, and so you, you wind up getting into sort of a mission mode in terms of trying to bring about that, that change. And um, the mission, as, as Camilla mentioned early on, early, early, earlier on, is simply just to make science open. It's a very powerful message, and it's a mission that will, that will have very strong, positive repercussions in all aspects of life. Um, but for a mission, uh, you need strategies, uh, you need tools, as Jean-Claude says all the time, you need teams, you need people together. And I think it's also very, very useful to have a map. Now, as I sat here, I, I, I don't know if it was particularly the case today, but there's an awful lot of map metaphoring going on uh, during, during the day. People were talking about landscapes, uh, cultural borders, barriers, centers of power, etc. And so I, 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 I was sitting here thinking, you know, why all this map metaphor? And, um, you know, I think it's, it's not an accident. I, I, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that um, there have been a certain numbers of very important events in this space over the last couple of weeks um, that, have, that have caused a crystallized people's thinking. Um, the European Open Science Cloud, we didn't spend too much time talking about it, but it was a very, very important uh, uh, landmark in this space. And, of course, of course, Plan S. And I think that these two events, what they've done, in a sense, is they've, they've, they've placed a strong frame of reference on everything we've talked about for so many years. And it has allowed us all to react to, to maybe little ideas that not, were never quite developed, that, um, you know, hesitations. Uh, um, and, and you can even do people talking about, uh, you know, all of these, these little aspects of open science that they've never really confronted themselves with. And this is a, a very valuable frame of reference that has been put into place over these next few weeks. And I think this is also why the discussions outside have been so explosive. It's starting, people are starting to realize the implications of moving forward with this new way of, uh, of framing the, the main questions behind open science. Um, I think um, I just want to just, just, just finish by saying that the, uh, the one of the strong advantages of really thinking about this whole problematic in terms of a map is that maps provide visibility. 
And you can look, you can see the landscape, and you can see ways forward, you can see things that block. It allows us to really make, uh, it'll be a, a tool in terms of being able to make uh, the, right, the right decisions in this very complicated terrain. Um, but let's just, as a community, recognize the, pr the, the perspectives, the needs, and the specif specificities of all the stakeholders as we move forward in this, in this context. So with that, uh, I would like to invite you all for the, for the post-meeting uh, aperitif. Thank you very much. Thank you.